last up in the session, uh, we have uh, Max Fischelson who will be telling us about uh, near optimal no regret learning for correlated equilibria in multiplayer general sum games. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Max. I'm here to talk to you about no regret learning for correlated equilibria, which is this work I did with these lovely people right here. Now, let's talk about online learning, all right? What's online learning all about? We got this menu of options, and we're going to repeatedly choose an option. So each time step, we make a choice. And then we get to observe the utility of our choice and the utility of all the choices we didn't make, you know? So we're gonna, we're gonna learn, we're gonna adapt from our mistakes and whatnot. We're even allowed in this uh, model to choose probabilistic distributions over the choices. No need for pure strategies. At the end of this, our total utility is the sum of the utilities we got on all the rounds. So there's this kind of spectrum of online learning questions, or settings rather. On one side of the spectrum, you have that these utilities are coming from some fixed distribution. That's like the easy side. On the other side, you have that these utilities are chosen adversarially to try to mess with our online learning as much as possible. And we're interested in this setting that kind of exists in between, which is the game setting. I know that's why we're all here. We love games. So you can imagine two guys just playing a game against each other over and over, trying to learn how to play the game. And this is, in some ways, a setting of online learning, right? Because every time this guy has a strategy, that's the same thing as me observing a utility vector over my potential options, right? And the same the other way. And this is the setting of online learning that's super important in all these applications <laughs> in the real world, you know, like these like competitive, like, you know, we're, we're trying to learn how to, how to bid in an ad auction. It's also how we like beat humans in poker. We had a poker robot play against itself over and over, online learning. So the success of these algorithms, how we grade them, is based on this notion of regret, okay? So regret is the utility that the algorithm actually obtained versus some sort of benchmark, okay? That benchmark is in terms of a transformation of the strategies we played. So it's like, you know, we played x1 to xt, what if we had instead played phi of x1 to phi of xt? How much better would we have done? We have some sort of, you know, class of, uh, of uh, you know potential deviations we call it capital V and we compare how we did to the best of all the possible things in this class okay so the classic is external regret okay we compare our performance to the performance we would have gotten of any of the best fixed actions we could have played so instead of going x1 xd what if we just stuck with some x star every single round we would you know do this much better now there's this thing called swap regret which is like a little bit more sophisticated we allow for you know competition against more uh, sophisticated uh, deviation functions. A good example of this is uh, if we had played the pure strategies A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and maybe the times that we played B, you know, we really messed up. But those other times, you know, we did pretty good. We're pretty happy about that. So we consider a swap of just the specific strategy B to something else, right? So this is a broader class of functions. So it's going to be harder to compete against this, harder to get lower regret in this setting. Uh, great way to motivate regret ties back to games, all right? Essentially, if we are able to minimize regret, we will tie this into these notions of equilibria in games. So, essentially, these, both of these guys uh, run these algorithms, they get sublinear external regret over time, something like epsilon d. We have this guarantee that their time average strategies will converge to a coarse correlated equilibrium of this game. But if they have the even better guarantee that they have convert, uh, sublinear regret and the stronger notion of regret, we have convergence in time average to the correlated equilibrium of the game, which is a stronger notion of equilibrium. Quick little review, you know, there's many different notions of equilibrium in games. There's Nash equilibria, which is computationally impossible, thanks to Das Galakis and the gang. We have coarse correlated equilibrium, which is, um, you know, feasible to compute, but like pretty permissive. Like there's some things that are coarse correlated equilibrium where it's like, is this really, is this really what we're going for here? So correlated equilibrium is this nice middle ground where it's like, okay, you know, a pretty beautiful <coughs> notion of equilibrium, computationally feasible. Um, if you're a little bit confused, you know, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but like, you know, we have this notion of correlated equilibrium involving this like centralized coordinated agent. This is a decentralized learning task. Essentially, we're coordinated by our shared history of the game, not a magical duck. Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about external regret first. We have this canonical algorithm for getting the low external regret known as optimistic follow the regularized leader, all right? We're essentially going to be choosing the best fixed action in hindsight, add in a little bit of uh, recency bias, add in a little bit of regularization, all right? 
If we look at the spectrum of potential utilities these are coming from, you know, this gets constant regret in the case of uh, fixed distribution. It's getting the square root of T of regret, even in the adversarial case, right? So like sublinear even in the worst case. And uh, since this whole line of research started in 2015, when Sir Khan said, I'll prove that in this game setting, we can actually do even better than the adversarial setting. T to the one fourth. And uh, recently, the fellows and I uh, got this down to something polylogarithmic. Now, uh, you might be a little confused. You're saying, like, what do you mean this game setting is better than the adversarial setting? Like, rock, paper, scissors seems like a pretty adversarial game, right? The thing is, when we're playing rock, paper, scissors, we're adversarial in each other's utilities, but not in each other's regrets. When you look at the actual worst case coming from the adversarial setting, where the square root of t comes from, you have this adversary who's like jumping all over the place, like tossing us utility vectors that are like all the way over here and then all the way over here, trying to mess with us, make us have a lot of regret. Whereas if we have two guys who are both running optimistic, follow the regularized leader, we have this thing where essentially, you know, there's this step size uh, in this algorithm, eta, where essentially, you know, every single round, I'm only going to be changing my strategy by like something that's like, you know, roughly at most eta. And so that means that, you know, if I'm changing my strategy slowly, the utility vectors that the other guys are seeing is changing slowly. Which means that he's going to be changing even slower, and then I'm going to get, like, even more stability over here. And so, right, the key idea behind getting down to the polylogarithmic regret is this thing called high order smoothness, right? Not only are the consecutive utilities that I'm observing bounded, but the consecutive differences of that sequence is even bounded by something smaller. And then the add the, 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 you know, you know, keep going. Uh, if you can think of, for example, the function sine of eta t, right? A very low frequency wave that has this property where it's like exponentially decreasing in the derivatives. Okay. So what is the proof that this algorithm achieves high order smoothness? It essentially comes from the following kind of inductive loop, right? If we have this bound on the eighth order derivative of my strategies, that's going to bound the eighth order derivative of my utilities, right? But then the thing is, so the utilities are in terms of the strategies, but then the strategies are in terms of the entire cumulative history of these utilities, right? So this gives us kind of this h plus first order derivative on the total sum, uh, it loops. Good stuff. All right, you know, we can talk later. All right, let's talk about swap regret. So we have these two canonical algorithms for achieving swap regret in, uh, in online learning, and they essentially both use, uh, uh, let's talk about Blumont's regret first. They use uh, OFTRL or an external regret algorithm as a black box. Essentially, you'll have a guy who's maintaining a copy of some external regret algorithm for every possible strategy. If we go back to that like, notion of swap regret, um, you know how it's like, oh, he's able to just swap out B for something else. Essentially, we'll have like, a version of the algorithm for every potential action that we want to swap out. Um, essentially, how the algorithm goes is we like, plug in like, a specific input to each of these algorithms. Each of these algorithms is going to give us a suggestion of what we should play. We put those in a matrix, and then we compute the Markov chain stationary distribution of that matrix. Um, the intuition to that involves a little bit more math, but it's like, right, this is going to give us this behavior where each of these algorithms is going to play the role of considering just swapping one specific strategy. Um, and so we have this nice guarantee where if this black box algorithm that we're using achieves good uh, external regret uh, in the adversarial setting, then this whole thing is going to achieve good swap regret, okay? So right, we have this transference of guarantees in the adversarial setting. The question is, do we still have these transferences in the game setting, right? So, uh, you know, right, we have this t to the one fourth, and then Chen and Pang in 2020 were able to get a match of t to the one fourth using similar techniques uh, in the game setting for swap regret. Uh, and essentially, the point of this result is that uh, we were able to get the polylogarithmic regret in the swap setting correlated equilibrium. Here are two theorems, both blum monsor and sol are going to converge to uh, correlated equilibrium in games at a rate of 1 over t, ignoring logarithmic factors. We're also getting polylogarithmic regret. It's good stuff. All right. Uh, essentially, let's talk a little bit about the proof techniques. You know, we have this loop of high work smoothness, right? This loop has an extra step now in the swap regret setting, right? Uh, essentially, you know, instead of, uh, you know, we have some sort of stability of this matrix Q, and we want to have some guarantee that the stationary distribution of that matrix is also stable in some way. Uh, the problem is, we can have very close matrices that have wildly different stationary distributions. I took a screenshot of the Chen and Pang Bay, right? Two matrices very close, very distant stationary distributions. So essentially, the same loop and trick is not going to work, and we got to do something a little more creative. Uh, the creativity in this paper comes from uh, first we were going to look at the explicit formula for the stationary distribution of a Markov chain. It comes from the Markov chain tree theorem. Essentially, the weight we put on an action is summing over all these trees of the, the product of the weights on all of these edges. 
And essentially, how we how we crack the cookie here, or egg, you know, crack cookies, um, you know, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> instead. So you know, we can't get the immediate high order smoothness on this original algorithm. But what we can do is we can show that the original algorithm performs identically to a OFTRL on this exponentially large game, where essentially each of the actions corresponds to one of these trees. Okay, and then the point is, you know, you can never actually run that algorithm. But we know that these two algorithms perform the same, and we know this one's high order smooth. Therefore, this one's high order smooth. That's all I got for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Uh, that reduction that you showed you were able to get yeah. from a previous paper that you had to this mm -hmm. correlated to that's basically going from coarse correlated equilibrium to correlated equilibrium. That's correct, yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Um, so, if I understand correctly, you're you're saying if both participants in this game play this like identical, known to be very good algorithm, do the results hold if they're playing sort of algorithms that are both, you know, have good regret but aren't necessarily this particular algorithm, or are you using the properties of this one? Yeah, so in this paper, we do very specifically use the properties of this one algorithm. A lot of the algorithms in this family have a similar property of, you know, it's just a little regularization, a little recency bias. Uh, I suspect that there's probably a way to, uh, you know, generalize this for some sort of class, like anyone, any sort of regularizer in this class. The specific regularizer we use in this paper is multiplicative weights updates, which is essentially using the negative entropy regularizer. But you can probably get something going on with uh, the class of regularizers. All right, thank you again.